and I welcome you to the show. This is a very special program today because we are going to be remembering Easter and we are going to be remembering Good Friday. So what I'm going to do this time, instead of finishing up at the end of the program with a word of prayer, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Because I really feel the Holy Spirit wants to say to you and me, we need to settle down. We really need to quiet our spirit so that we can hear the voice of God. We are so used to running everywhere, everywhere, back and forwards, get a cup of tea and get your tea and your coffee first. Sit down and listen to the word of God. So I'm going to pray for us right at the outset. Heavenly Father, we are today remembering probably the greatest sacrifice that you made in the history of the earth. Now, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us a spirit of peace so that we can really hear what the Spirit of God is trying to tell us. And then not only that, Lord, but to act upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Even as I'm praying, there's a little bird up in the tree here. You might not be able to hear it, but it is singing so beautifully. So I want to speak to you about afflictions. We start off with Psalm 34 and verse 19, which states, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Many afflictions. It's not a case of, well, that's all by the way. No, it's not at all. This is part of our lives. And then we go straight to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14 and verse 32. Mark 14 and verse 32. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. Now, I've been to Gethsemane. Many times. It's one of my favorite places in Israel. It's just outside the old city. You go up the Lion's Gate. You go down the road, across the Kidron Valley, and up the other side to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the same valley that David fled when his son, who he loved so much, Absalom, was bent on killing him. He had to flee in the middle of the night. I'm talking about afflictions. I want to say to you now, I don't think there's anything more painful than a family that is in turmoil, where children are not speaking to their parents and parents are having no contact with their children. That is Gethsemane. I'm not talking about anything else. I'm talking about relationships. And that is what Gethsemane in my humble opinion, is all about. And so they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here for a while while I pray. Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. Now, folks, what I want to speak to you about today is something that's deep in my heart. If I had to say to you, the most painful part of the ministry and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, what was it? You would probably say straight away, the crucifixion. And it's true. There was nothing more painful than the crucifixion. That's what the Romans did. They, they hung you on a cross, a piece of wood, and they put spikes through your hands and through your feet, and they left you to die. But the pain that I'm going to speak about is more painful, in my opinion, than a physical death. And that is a spiritual death and a spiritual challenge. I'm talking about distress. I'm talking about tor or torment, to be tormented. I'm talking about being burdened. I'm talking about pain spiritual pain, and suffering. Now, Gethsemane was known as the olive press. 
That's what Gethsemane means in Hebrew. It's where the olives were crushed so that the olive oil, that beautiful golden olive oil, could be extracted. Now, that garden is still there today. Those olive trees are 2,000 years old. I want to say to you today, my dear friend, that an olive tree never dies, you see. What it does, it keeps returning, it keeps growing. So the original trees are there. There's about 14, I think, I'm not 100% sure. But when you go into that place, it's like you're going back 2,000 years ago. Those trees are so old. And often I would just sit in a little bench and look at those trees and try and picture that night when the Savior of the world took all of our sin upon Him. Now, we know that uh, He is sovereign. We know that. We know that Jesus Christ is God made flesh. But the Bible tells us that He became as a man. In other words, He suffered every single pain and disappointment and heartbreak that you and I suffer. And that is why I love him so much. And that is why ultimately he is the one that we go to when we have a need because he understands. The worst thing ever to say to someone who has just lost a, a child or someone who has just gone bankrupt or someone who has just been told by the specialist, you have got three months to live, go home, make yourself comfortably comfortable because you are going to die. When, you, when that gets told to the person and you say, I understand, you need to be very careful because 90% of the time you don't understand unless you've been there. But Jesus does understand. And that is the message for today. For a person to say, no, no, you know, we, we, we covered by the blood of the lamb. I know that. And Jesus is alive. We know that too. But I want to tell you, one old preacher once said, without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. Oh, I can't wait for Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday every, every Easter. But before that, we've got to go through Gethsemane. And I want to tell you, I have a major problem. And maybe you say I'm being legalistic, but it's just who I am. Jesus saved me from much, folks. Without Jesus Christ in my life, I was destined to probably die in a gutter or somewhere because I couldn't handle the pressure of what I was going through. So for me on Good Friday, when we remember the death on the cross and Thursday night when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, for someone to say, well, you know, we're going um, skiing today or we're going, um, we're going surfing or we're going to go and have a party, I say, surely you can give him one day, one day out of 365, where you can sit down on your own and meditate. That's why we are making this program in the garden, which is just outside the beautiful chapel, which was built 43 years ago by my late dad and myself. These trees were planted. These are old trees now, but there is a peace and a tranquility in this place. And that's why our producer has chosen this place to make this particular program. Stress. There is more stress in the world now than there's ever been. Jesus, our beloved, suffered more than any other person ever in the history of the universe. I want to ask you a question today. Are you struggling? What are you struggling with? Are you, are you struggling with depression, fear, anxiety, stress? That's all those things that Jesus suffered in the garden on Easter Thursday night before Easter Friday. Fear. What about betrayal? What about desertion? I don't think there's anything worse than betrayal. It's just who I am. You know, my heart weeps when I think of how Jesus had the Last Supper, and I've been there too, by the way, it's just on the other side of the Valley Kidron, the upper room. I've been inside there. There's no ornaments. There's nothing there. It's plain. 
I can imagine Jesus sitting with his disciples on the floor as they did, as was their custom, maybe on some cushions, and having a meal. You need to have more meals together, folks. And then he not only fed his disciples, but he washed their dirty feet. And when he was finished with that, then he told the man that he loved, who walked with him for three years, saw Jesus walking on water, by the way, saw Jesus speaking with his father and Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said to him, go and do what you have to do. And Judas Iscariot got up and he went out and he betrayed the darling of the world. Makes me want to cry. Betrayal is a terrible thing. When someone you love dearly betrays you, whether it's uh, having an affair and uh, ending up in the divorce courts, it breaks people, folks. And that's what Jesus came to, to deal with. He really does understand what it means to be betrayed. I want to tell you a, a moving story. When I was a young preacher, I was invited down to Peter Maritzburg. Peter Maritzburg is probably an hour's drive south from here. And it was a lovely church, and we had a beautiful meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I called people forward for prayer. And there was a lot of people that night. And as they were lining up, I saw an old couple. And I could see straight away they were farmers. <laughs> farmers have got a unique way of dressing. The old gentleman had a tweed jacket on. He had a deer stalker on. I can't remember if he had a walking stick or not. And his dear wife, she had put makeup on her face. You know, the old ladies with that red rouge on their cheeks. And she had round glasses. I'll never forget it. On her eye. And beautiful snow white hair, all tied up nicely. She might have even had a little hat on, if I can't remember. If I don't remember correctly. And I, I walked straight up to them. Because my heart just went out to them. And they were holding each other tightly. And they looked like a couple that were like vulnerable. You know, I wanted to kind of put my arms around them and shelter them. And I said to them, what can I pray for? And the old lady burst into tears. And she said, it's our son. They were farmers. I was quite right. It's our son, Angus. And what is wrong with your son? Our son is stealing from us. Well, I, I think I just started crying straight away. Our son is stealing from us. And I thought, what a foolish young man. He's going to inherit the farm. There's no doubt about that. But he just couldn't wait. Now that to me is the ultimate of betrayal. When somebody that you trust, and they just walk away from you or they drop you. Folks, to me, for Jesus... That is more painful than going to the cross. You see, in the garden was the time of decision. In the garden, the Lord, if he, he said to the Lord, Lord, take this cup from me. Oh, yes, that's what he said. And then hopefully and gladly for you and me, he said, but not my will. Thy will be done. If he hadn't said that, his father would have taken him home and there'd be no more life. But he came to die for you and me. Yet not my will, but thy will be done. I want to say to you today, that uh, person that is, has betrayed you, forgive them. You have to forgive them, because in forgiving them, there's going to be healing in your life. I want to say to you today, that you have to forgive, because Jesus said so, and that's enough. And so, the Lord sweated blood. Now, people have written to me and said, not really, it was a fig, just a, um, a, a comment, he sweated blood. Now, doctors have said, and don't write to me and tell me it's not true, it is true because it's in the book, that when a man is under so much pressure and stress, blood actually comes out of the pores on his skin, and he sweated drops of blood on his knees in the garden. Now, folks, when the, 
when the high priest soldiers arrived, and there wasn't just one or two of them, there was a whole lot of them. He kind of said, why didn't you come before? Why do you wait for such a time? And of course, the one who betrayed him, this is even more painful. And I'm doing this on purpose. I'm telling you what life is about. And Jesus knows. Just remember those two words. Jesus knows. Oh, you don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't know what you're going through. So I will not say to you, I understand. What I am going to say to you is, Jesus knows. You see, because when they came into the garden, a whole horde of them, and they were all armed with spears and clubs. And who came forward? The betrayer. He said to the soldiers, I will show you who he is. He will be the one that I will kiss. Folks, doesn't get worse than that. I know there's a man watching this program and he's crying because his wife has betrayed him for another man. I know there's young people today who are broken because their folks have walked away from them. I know that there's a businessman. No, no, no. No, thought, no fault of his own. His business has gone down. He's got no more friends. They've just disappeared. They've just gone into the mist. They're nowhere to be seen. And yet he was so popular when he was making lots of money. Jesus knows. Oh, yes, Jesus knows. And so he kissed him. You know, folks, Jesus in that time of absolute betrayal, what was he doing? He was thinking of the disciples. He said to the high priest soldiers, I am he. Let these go. Huh? Right to the end. Jesus will never betray you. He will never forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. He will always be there for you. And with that, the Bible says, and they all, not some of them, they all forsook him and fled. They all ran away from the only person in the universe who could save them. And they fled and he stood alone. Now, if you go, there's a special church on the other side of the Kidron Valley. And it's, um, it's got a big cockerel, a big rooster up, uh, up on that church. And that is to commemorate how when Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ, here we go again, betrayal, denied him three times. Inside that church, there is a pit, must be 10, 12 foot high, just a pit, an empty pit. And that is where they say, used to be the high priest's um, um, palace, they put the master inside that pit. And he spent the whole night there before he was taken out for trial with Pontius Pilate the next day, on his own in that pit. I've been down there. I wept, I'm telling you. So if you're feeling betrayed today, at this Easter time, if you're feeling disappointed, if you have been left and your family has gone overseas, wherever, and left you, remember there's one who will never, ever leave you because he knows. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Remember, no crucifixion, no resurrection. Oh, we'll speak to you again on Resurrection Sunday. Don't worry about that. But today we are talking about heavy things. Heavy things, and I'm talking to you on purpose. Now, how can we handle this? Angus, you've told us what, is, what the problem is. Now, what's the solution? Oh, the solution is one word, Jesus. The solution, he took me out of a bottomless pit. He took David out as well, by the way, out of a bottomless pit. And he set him on a rock. That same Kidron Valley is the same valley that David fled for his life when his son, who he loved, he loved Absalom right to the end, who was trying to kill him. He was chasing after him. And Joab, the general, led by God, pursued that young man and his, and his supporters and drove a javelin through his back while he was hanging up in the tree, caught by his hair. The most handsome man in Israel, apparently. But he betrayed his own dad. 
But we understand about betrayal here. I want to say to you, there's many who have betrayed you. Maybe your friend at school. Maybe a man who promised you, I will be with you to the end. I will never leave you. I've had them, many. You know, if I had to take my shirt off now and show you, in the spirit, there are scars between my shoulder blades. That's where people who I have trusted have put their dagger. Remember, the only man that can stab you is one who you trust. Happened to Julius Caesar, didn't it? Well, what am I saying? I'm saying there is only one who we can really trust. And he knows. And he says, it's all right. I understand. So what do we do? What is the solution? Well, the solution is found in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your burdens, cast your cares upon Jesus because he alone cares for you. Give him your burdens and then simply stand. I'll say that again. Simply stand. Stop fighting. Stop saying, I want retribution. Stop saying, I want revenge. Just stand. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 says, stand because the battle is the Lord's. It is Jesus who will do the fighting for you and you will have the victory. Oh, yes. I want to tell you the sun's going to come up on the third day. Easter Sunday morning is going to be a glorious day. But we need to understand we are living in the real world, folks. We've got to go through these things. You cannot shelter your children or your loved ones. It's reality. What can I do? Teach them the Word. Teach them the Bible. And when these things come against them, they will be able to stand because Jesus will stand with them. If he sets you free, the Bible says, you shall be free indeed. And that's what he did for me. So this is a very special time for me. And it's a very special program because this is the time every single year I come aside and I contemplate and I meditate and I remember what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. But I also remember what he went through in the Garden of Gethsemane where he could have pulled out if he wanted but he didn't. He went through the olive press and he was crushed for your sin and my sin so that we could go free. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. Please take time out to sit and to think of what the master did for you and for me. God bless you and goodbye.